Hi everyone, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The tragic story of a young school teacher named Lacey Peterson not only shocked the public with its unimaginable cruelty and inhumanity, but also served as a precedent for the adoption of a law of the same name, known as the Lacey and Connor Act. Connor was the name of her unborn son, who died with his mother, and the law itself was designed to protect children from violence before they were born, and to punish those who infringe on their lives and health. The case itself is far from unique, but the fact that a pregnant woman was abused by a close person, who was supposed to protect and care for her, is shocking and bewildering. Several TV documentaries have been made about the case. Despite the circumstantial evidence and controversial evidence, no one doubted the guilt of the defendant, and he himself with all his appearance demonstrated that he is not sorry and does not repent for what he did. This story is one of those that causes chills all over the body, but let's try to understand how it happened that the guy, who was considered a model family man, suddenly decided to commit such an atrocity. Who was Lacey Peterson? Lacey Denise Peterson, maiden name Rocha, was born in May 1975 in a small town of Modesto, located in the central part of the state of California. Her parents, Dennis Rocha and Sharon Anderson, were acquainted since high school. Their teenage romance led to marriage and the birth of two children, eldest son Brandon and daughter Lacey. Curiously, the mother named her daughter after a local beauty queen, whom she herself admired. The family owned their own farm, so the children from a young age were accustomed to working in the field, as well as taking care of animals. The girl was very close to her mother. Together they grew a wonderful garden with flowers and fruit trees. Then Lacey first thought about connecting her future life with this occupation and getting a specialized profession. When the children were still small, the family faced a crisis. No matter how hard the spouses tried, but they could not save the marriage and soon they officially divorced. The children, by mutual consent, remained to live with their mother in their hometown. Two years later, Sharon remarried. Her chosen one was a friend of her youth named Ron Gransky. Ron treated his wife's children as his own, and in fact replaced their birth father, who after the divorce was not too interested in the life of the heirs. The girl even began to call him Daddy, and a couple of years later the couple had a common daughter, who was named Emily. Lacey grew up a kind, sociable, and open girl. She always had a lot of friends. She studied well in school, and was also a member of the cheerleading team. After receiving a high school education, the dark-haired beauty successfully passed exams and entered the prestigious California State University. She did not forget about her childhood dream and decided to become a landscape designer. Lacey has always been a creative person, good at drawing, so she found the chosen profession ideal for herself. Who is Scott Peterson? Scott Lee Peterson is also a native of California, only he was born in the large metropolis of San Diego, in the southwest of the state, in 1972, October 24th, in the family of Jacqueline Helena Lethem and Arthur Lee Peterson. The boy grew up in a fairly well-to-do family, and from an early age did not know anything to refuse. His father had his own business associated with the production of packaging materials, and his mother owned a store of designer clothes. By the way, her boutique was located in Hollywood, so among the regular customers were many celebrities. Scott in childhood began to show his difficult character, liked to be in the center of attention, did not tolerate bans or refusals, and in school about him spoke as a spoiled, capricious, and even arrogant child. From a young age, the boy played golf and even thought about a professional career in this sport. In his school years, he was friends with Philip Mickelson, nicknamed Lefty, the future professional golfer, who in 2012 was ranked second in the world rankings. As a teenager, Scott himself was among the best athletes in San Diego. After graduation, the young man became a student at one of the universities of the state of Arizona, where he, as a promising athlete, paid half of the cost of education. However, Peterson could not get a diploma because he was expelled for inappropriate behavior after a raucous party, drinking strong alcohol in the company of other students. After several months of reflection and searching for a suitable place, the young man applied to the University of California, where he first planned to study economics 
but later changed his mind and transferred to the Faculty of Agriculture. By the way, this time Scott very seriously and responsibly approached the educational process, becoming an exemplary student, because his parents threatened to leave their son without a livelihood if he was once again expelled. Scott and Lacey, a love story. Young people met during the period of study at the university. Scott at that time began to work part-time in one of the local coffee shops, where there also worked as a waitress former classmate and close friend of Lacey. Lacey often stopped by to grab a bite to eat and see her friend, and at some point, she noticed the handsome young man. Scott also noticed the smiling petite brunette and began to pay her every possible attention. One day, when Lacey came to the coffee shop but didn't see her friend there, she decided to ask Scott what was wrong. They quickly got to talking, but since Scott had to work, Lacey wrote her phone number on a napkin so they could get in touch later. Scott called her back that evening, and an excited Lacey, immediately after talking to him, told her mother that she had been in touch with her future husband. A couple days later, he asked his new acquaintance out on a first date, and Lacey readily accepted. It's worth noting that Peterson had another passion besides golf, fishing, and he decided to invite Lacey to go deep-sea fishing in an open body of water. She accepted the offer, but she got seasick in the boat, so the couple had to quickly return to the shore. Family life. Nevertheless, after that not-quite-successful first date, the couple began to meet, and a couple of years later, they decided to start living together. Scott, by that time, finally abandoned his dreams of a professional career in sports and decided to start his own small business, and with the startup capital, he helped his parents. In the summer of 1997, after Lacey received her diploma, the lovers played a modest wedding in the traditional style, with a white dress, veil, and vows at the altar. They invited only family members and a few close friends to the celebration, and as a venue, they chose the popular Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort, located on the ocean in the western part of the state of California. After the wedding, the couple settled in the small resort town of San Luis Obispo, located between Los Angeles and San Francisco. There they decided to open their own sports bar, but the idea was doomed from the start. There were rumors that Scott's parents again helped with the implementation of the business plan, but they themselves later denied it, saying that their son was a poor businessman, and they realized this while he was still studying at the university. Anyway, the business of the couple really did not go very well at first. They constantly had problems, then with the institution itself, then with the management. But gradually, they managed to spin. The number of visitors over time increased, and in 2000, when the Petersons decided to sell the institution, it was already considered a fairly well-known and popular place. The couple decided to move to their hometown of Lacey to put down roots and have children. There they bought a small, cozy house in a good neighborhood, bought a car, got a dog, and about a year later, the young woman told her husband the happy news. Soon they will become parents. By that time, Lacey had decided to change her occupation and got a job at a local school as an art teacher. Her husband was having a harder time finding a job and was forced to take a job with a fertilizer and organic fertilizer company. Lacey tried to be an impeccable wife, to create comfort and peace in her and her husband's new home. She kept everything in perfect order, enjoyed cooking, loved to host guests, and had a beautiful flower garden on the lawn. Scott seemed to support his wife in everything, and from the outside they looked like a perfect couple. The news of the upcoming addition to the family he also accepted with joy, and when the couple learned that they will have a boy, they actively began to choose a name for him. The future parents decided to name their son Connor, and everyone was sure that they were looking forward to the arrival of the child into the world. Disappearance of a Pregnant Teacher On December 24, 2002, Lacey, who was eight months pregnant, mysteriously disappeared. The first alarms were raised by Lacey's mother and stepfather, who had been unable to contact her all day. She didn't answer the phone, nor did she return calls, which was unusual for her. As it turned out, the husband was also unaware of his wife's whereabouts. The day before, she had visited her parents and also visited the beauty salon where her sister Amelia worked. She was in good spirits, 
preparing for Christmas and New Year's Eve celebrations. In the morning, Lacey allegedly went for a walk with the dog, but a couple of hours later, neighbors found the Peterson's dog wandering down the street with a dirty leash dragging behind him. At the time, no one even suspected anything wrong. The neighbor, he said, simply thought the dog had escaped, so he took him to the backyard of the owner's residence. Toward evening, the worried parents called the police and reported him missing, asking them to start searching immediately because Lacey was pregnant, and if she was in trouble, she needed help as soon as possible. But neither that day nor the next, she was never found. A day later, news of the local teacher's disappearance spread throughout the town, and hundreds of volunteers joined the search for her. People combed the area, pasted flyers with portraits of the girl, as well as organized search pages in social networks, where they posted detailed information with the signs of the missing. Mom, stepfather, older brother, and younger sister appealed to all concerned on television with a request to help in the search and share any useful information for which a reward was even announced, except that Scott behaved somewhat strangely and even suspiciously. He did not take part in press conferences, was not too interested in the results of the search, and did not look particularly concerned. According to the investigator who handled the case, Mr. Peterson's behavior made him suspicious from the start. He was frighteningly calm, and the police officer's questions irritated him. He himself asked no questions, behaved arrogantly, and most interestingly confused his statements, changing them repeatedly. Scott was the last person to see his spouse on the day of her disappearance. According to him, he went to the golf course in the morning to get some exercise and play, while his wife stayed home and planned to walk the dog and do some cleaning afterward. When he returned home, he found the dog in the backyard, but Lacey was nowhere to be found. Scott did not go to the police because he thought that his wife was visiting her parents. But later, when she still did not show up, he got worried and called his mother-in-law's house, where he was told that Lacey did not come to them. And that's where the first inconsistencies in Scott's testimony came to light. First, no one could confirm his alibi, as he had not been seen on the golf course. Second, the father-in-law claimed, and this was later confirmed by the taped conversations, that he had called Scott himself when he was looking for his stepdaughter, but he replied that he had no idea where she might be. Peterson then quickly changed tactics and stated that he had changed his mind about playing golf, deciding instead to go fishing at a secluded spot in Berkeley Harbor. He attributed the confusion over the phone calls to the fact that all the relatives were on edge and couldn't remember who had called whom or when. During the inspection of the couple's home, a rather strange and frightening detail was discovered. The missing Lacey's purse, which contained her house keys, phone, and some cash. These are things that she certainly wouldn't have left the house without, even going for a walk to the nearest park with her dog. How would she lock the front door? This nuance was alarming and raised suspicions that Lacey hadn't disappeared somewhere on the street but had vanished from her own home. A grisly discovery. On April 13th, almost four months after the pregnant teacher's disappearance, local fishermen noticed something strange on the rocky shores of San Francisco Bay and decided to go closer to examine their find. As it turned out, their attention was drawn to the body of an infant that had been washed ashore. The boy's body had hardly undergone decomposition, but it was badly disfigured, apparently due to the fact that the body had been battered by the waves against the rocks for a long time. His umbilical cord was not cut, but as if torn off. A day later, in another part of the bay, a few kilometers from where the infant was found, the badly decomposed body of a young woman was found. The corpse was so disfigured that it was not immediately recognizable as human remains. But the most gruesome thing was that the body was missing its head and most of each of its limbs. There were only a few fragments of clothing left on the body, including a special maternity bra. It was simply impossible to identify the body, so it was possible to establish that it belonged to the missing teacher only through DNA examination. According to criminalists, the baby was well-preserved only because all this time he was in the womb. But in the process of decomposition, the body rejected the fetus. According to eyewitnesses who found the boy, something strange resembling a ribbon or rope was draped around his neck and there was a large cut on his body. 
Although the results of the autopsy were never officially published, the experts claimed that the cut was the result of a wave hitting the body against a sharp rock and that the noose around his neck was just trash. Throughout the investigation and search, Scott remained at large. Moreover, Lacey's parents actively defended their son-in-law for the first few days, calling him an ideal husband and their union a happy one, built on love and trust. But the more the police learned about this guy, the more suspicious he seemed to them. So soon it turned out that Peterson constantly cheated on his wife, and his first extramarital affair occurred almost immediately after the wedding, even before the couple moved to Modesto. Later, he had many more mistresses, to whom he lied about not being married or recently widowed. Thus, in the fall of 2002, Scott met on a blind date with a charming blonde named Amber Frey. The girl worked as a masseuse and raised a young daughter on her own. She was looking for a life partner who would love and accept her along with her child, and handsome, polite Scott she immediately liked. The feelings were mutual. Scott admitted almost immediately that he had recently been widowed, and the coming Christmas would be the first one he would spend without his beloved deceased wife. Amber consoled him as best she could, and from that day forward, they began communicating almost daily. Soon, Scott informed his mistress that they could move in together after the holidays, and the couple began planning a future together. True, Scott noted that he never wanted to have children of his own, and seriously intends to undergo a sterilization procedure, vasectomy, but at the same time, he was ready to raise daughter Amber as his own. All was well until Amber accidentally saw a TV report about the disappearance of a local pregnant teacher. Despite the fact that the husband of the missing woman did not give interviews and did not appear in front of the camera lenses, the broadcast showed pictures of her and Lacey together, in which Amber recognized her lover. Another curious feature was the fact that Scott, soon after the disappearance of his wife, radically changed his image, growing a beard and bleaching his naturally dark hair on his head and face. At first, Amber could not believe her eyes and hoped that she imagined it, but soon she was convinced that she was dating the same guy. She immediately went to the police and told them everything, even agreeing to record their phone conversations. During one of their conversations, Amber wondered why Scott had told her he was a widower a couple weeks before his wife disappeared. But he must have sensed something was wrong, but he was evasive. As soon as the bodies of the dead mother and child were discovered, the question of immediately arresting Scott as the prime suspect arose. Despite the fact that the investigation had no hard evidence, there was a high probability that Scott would try to leave the country. In fact, that's exactly what he was going to do. But fortunately, he didn't have time. The widower was taken into custody on April 18, 2003, but he categorically refused to admit his guilt. At the same time, his house, garage, and car were searched in detail, with frightening results. Microparticles of Lacey's dried blood were found on tools in the garage, and in the trunk of the car and at the bottom of the fishing boat, experts found several hairs of the dead woman. The clothes Scott was wearing on that fateful day were long since gotten rid of. The house had undergone several general cleanings with the help of cleaning services, and the building itself had already been put up for sale. But the most difficult part of the investigation was the inability to establish the exact date of Lacey's death, which in turn made it impossible to verify the suspect's alibi. The investigation was also hampered by traces of cement found in the garage, in the trunk, and in Peterson's boat. The material was believed to be the basis for a homemade anchor with which he wanted to dispose of the body so that it would never be found. Although there was no direct evidence against Scott, he was found guilty of two counts of first and second degree murder. Despite the vigorous and rather confident defense of the lawyers, almost no one had any doubts that Scott was guilty. The main proof of this was his behavior. He was not excited or upset. He took no part in the search. He was in a hurry to get rid of the evidence, put his wife's house and car for sale almost immediately after her disappearance, changed his image, and was going to leave the country with his mistress. Investigator Jonathan Bueller, who had been on the case since Lacey's disappearance, said in court that he had no doubts about Peterson's guilt from the start. He realized this after his first conversation with him. The court initially imposed the death penalty as a punishment, 
but after a series of appeals filed with enviable regularity, the sentence was changed in 2021 to life imprisonment without the right to ever expect to be released. Also, the amount of the insurance, in the amount of a quarter of a million dollars, for the life of Lacey, which was originally assigned in favor of Scott, the court redirected the mother of the deceased. This high-profile case horrified the public and raised the issue of the need to protect unborn children from violence, who may become victims of similar crimes. Thus, in the spring of 2004, the Lacey and Connor Act was passed, with the parents and sister of the deceased woman present at the signing. Three years after the tragedy, Sharon Rocha published a biographical book dedicated to her daughter and grandson titled In Memory of Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss, and Justice. All money raised from the sale of the publication was donated to charity. The book itself was among the top bestsellers in American nonfiction. Sharon's husband and stepfather Lacey passed away in the spring of 2018 from a heart attack, shortly before another court hearing. He was buried next to his beloved stepdaughter and grandson. By the way, Lacey's own father passed away in December of that same year. Thanks for watching, guys. Jack was with you. Subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.